welcome. Welcome to any guests or visitors this day. I'm glad to see everyone. A nice rain that we had. <laughs> a uh, pastor was visiting with a new member. And uh, he asked the new member, he said, how's your relationship with God? And the new member answered, well, there's really not too much to tell. I like sinning. God likes forgiving. We get along just fine. <laughs> with this kind of thinking, uh, someone wrote, really the world is admirably arranged. People like the admirably <coughs> arranged world. It's comfortable. It's easy. It doesn't ask much of us. We can make an apology when we've done something wrong. As uh, children and grandchildren come up, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then they go back and do it again. But we then can say, OK, please forgive me, God. And we go on about life. It's business as usual, no big deal. We get to do what we like. God gets to do what he likes. But what about you? Does this sound familiar? Does, does your life and faith sometimes express an admirably arranged world? To be honest, at times, that's how we've all lived our life. And we've seen it in the lives of others. The problem with an admirably arranged world is that wounds are not healed. Relationships are not put back together. Lives are not transformed. Nothing really changes. It's kind of like the movie Groundhog Day. Too often we settle for an admirably arranged world instead of becoming, and here's what the Apostle Paul says, Slaves of righteousness, or slaves of God, slaves of righteousness, leading to sanctification. That is, a different, living a different way. Where you don't like sinning. We're going to focus on that this morning. Because the abiding presence of God's grace in our lives means that when we confess our sins, God not only forgives our sins, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, He makes us, leads us, empowers us to love, to forgive, to reconcile, to help, to serve, and to share the grace of Christ with others. Our lives in Him are transformed. We join in our opening hymn, number 904.
We continue our worship by turning to Divine Service, setting three. You'll find it on page 184 in the front of our hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Good morning, God. Good morning. Third car in there was loud. Third car in the parsonage was the one that the alarm was going off. But I can't oh, Almighty God, merciful Father. your confession. I, by virtue of my office, as an ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to take from your bulletin the uh, worship insert entitled The Fourth Sunday After Pentecost, as we join in reading responsibly the intro. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. That I may walk before God in the light of life. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What the flesh do to me? In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Glory be to God. delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling.
be with you. Let us pray. Oh God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our reading from the, our Lutheran Confessions comes from the formula of comfort, the solid declaration, where we read, the apology provides an excellent model that shows how and when exhortations to good works can be made without darkening the doctrine of faith and of the article of justification. In Article 20, on the passage 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, it says. Peter speaks of works following the forgiveness of sins and teaches why they should be done. They should be done so that the calling may be sure. That is, should they fall from their calling if they sin again? Do good works in order that you may persevere in your calling, in order that you do not lose the gifts of your calling. They were given to you before and not because of works that follow and which now are kept through faith. Faith does not remain in those who lose the Holy Spirit and reject repentance. On the other hand, this does not mean that faith lays hold of righteousness and salvation only in the beginning and then resigns its office to works as though they had to sustain faith, the righteousness received in salvation. It means that the promise, not only of receiving, but of also retaining righteousness and salvation, is firm and sure to us. St. Paul, in Romans 5, 2, ascribes to faith not only the entrance to grace, but says that we stand in grace and boast of the future glory. In other words, he credits the beginning, middle, and end to faith alone. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. Romans eleven twenty. He will present your, you holy and blameless and above reproach before him if indeed you continue in the faith. Colossians 1, 22 and 23. By God's power, you are being guarded through faith for a salvation. 1 Peter 1, 5. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1, 9. It is clear from God's word that faith is the proper and only means through which righteousness and salvation are not only received, but also preserved by God. Therefore, it is right to reject the Council of Trent's decree, and whatever elsewhere is set forth with the same meaning. For they say our good works preserve salvation, or the righteousness of faith that has been received, or even faith itself. They say it is either entirely or in part kept and preserved by our works. But... We are saved by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone, as Scripture alone tells us. I invite you to follow along with me as God's Word is read. This is on the back of the bulletin insert. And the Old Testament reading uh, for this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, is from the book of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. But the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me, 
as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Paul's letter to Romans, the sixth chapter, and this is the text for our sermon. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now... Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things in which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise. according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father is child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father, 
who is in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. I now invite you on page 191 or in the back cover of your hymnal to join with me as we confess our faith as I ask you, dear Christian, what do you believe? I believe Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under conscious life. He suffered and was buried. sinful life's fears, hopelessness, and life's grind with the assurance that he is in control of our destiny right now. 
The word of the Lord for the strength of our faith and living of our lives is the epistle lesson that we just read from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Today, St. Paul exhorts us, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies. Now notice he did not say, Don't let sin happen. For that indeed is impossible. There's not one of us without sin and without need of forgiveness. But he did say, do not let it reign. Do not let it rule you, your thoughts, your words, or actions. Do not let it be in charge. And that, I think, is something we would all agree with. No one wants to be under the rule of sin. But the question for us today is not what we want, but what is. What is it like in your life? Do you control your sin? Or does your sin control you? So let's take a look at your life and mine. When we are hurt, what's our first instinct? To forgive or to hurt back? What are you more likely to do? Hold a grudge or let it go? <coughs> Build a bridge or stay angry? Do you lose your temper and lash out at others? What about despair? Do the people, events, and tragedies around us reveal a lack of faith and trust in our good and gracious God by making us fretful or despondent where we wake up in the middle of the night and we can't get back to sleep filled with worry and anxiety in all these ways we see the sin that lives in us but the question remains is it controlling us what about how we view sin or how we react to it? That might reveal something. For do we consider sin dangerous? Certainly if someone were to come up to you and point a gun at you, you would recognize the danger of the situation. A friend of mine one time was in a restaurant on a date many years ago and some men came in, and they robbed the place. And they were going to take that girl who he just went out with the first time, going to take her ring off her finger, was her grandmother's. And he said, don't take that. And they put the gun right here. When the police came, oh, by the way, when the men left, they said, uh, if anyone asked where the James came, I guess Jesse, um, but... They asked, please ask him, do you know what kind of gun it was? And my friend says, no, but the barrel was this big. <laughs> How about this? Consider the fighting in Ukraine. Those folks recognize the danger that's headed for their towns, and so they're out to prevent it. Or when a car swerves into your lane while you are driving, you see the danger, you try to avoid it. I suppose you wave high afterwards. <laughs> do, we see, do we see sin like those things? As danger bearing down on us? Or have we lost our fear of sin and think it harmless? Or think that when we're sin, ah, we're just being a little naughty, everybody does it. You all need to be naughty once in a while, right? No. So what do we make of this? Is sin controlling our minds, our thoughts, our actions. St. Paul seems to see sin quite differently than most of us, calling it not harmless or naughty, but he calls it slavery. Captivity. Surely that's not a good thing. Sin zaps us of our strength. It whispers hopeless thoughts in the midst of our efforts. It overwhelms us with guilt and a feeling of loss and loneliness. It exacts a price. And yet, do we sometimes or 
oftentimes see sin as enjoyable, like getting even, or pleasurable, even necessary, enjoying ourselves as we defame another person's reputation, finding pleasure in greed or gluttony or lust, or thinking we have to tell little lies. We have a right not to forgive after what they did to me. Yeah, everybody cheats on their taxes. Or that it's okay to take advantage of someone. So what do you think? Do you control your sin? Or does your sin control you? Now, listen carefully. Answer I'm going to give you might surprise you. It's neither. For while it's true you do not always control your sin because you do sin, we do, it is also true that your sin does not control you. It does not have dominion over you as your king, as your lord. And you know what the evidence of that is? The fact that we're looking at each other today. We're here. We are here today under a different king, a different Lord. We are here to repent of our sin and live under him. We are here that he may have dominion over our life by his word, spirit, and forgiveness. And so you're doing exactly what St. Paul said to do when he said, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have domin no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. You are here presenting yourselves to God in repentance that through his forgiveness he raised you to a new life and use your members for righteousness. And when you are here in repentance, sin does not have dominion over you. For if sin were your Lord and your King, you would not be here. But you are here. We're here. We're here to live under Him, under Christ and His kingdom, and serve Him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. For the opposite of sinning for the Christian is not to not sin. That's usually what we think of first, right? But as I said at the beginning of this sermon, that's impossible for us. And it is to live under the law, relying on what I can do, relying on my strength, like the little engine that could, telling ourselves, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can get over the mountain of sin in my life. The problem is that that mountain of sin in our lives is a mountain that has no end. And while we may think we can, we can't. And all our effort to overcome sin will simply wear us out. And sooner or later, crush us. And so the opposite of sinning for the Christian is not to not sin. It's not to look to ourselves for the solution. The solution is to look to Christ. For the Christian, the opposite of sinning is to repent, for that is to live under grace. That is to come before our King exactly as we are and exactly as He wants us, as needy and undeserving, to receive His gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. And that's the highest worship of God, not to offer Him our goodness, but to receive His. To come here in repentance and faith, to look to Christ for the answer to your sin, and to live as the baptized Christian that you are. For the Christian life begins here, and then it goes out there. What you receive here is lived out there. And know here, then know there. And you very likely will have a different king, a different Lord ruling over you. Life without God eventually comes to nothing. But it is your baptism that sets you apart, that has raised you from a dead life of sin to a new life in Christ. 
that has made you a child of God, a member of his family. That's what St. Paul talked about in the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 6, right before our text. And that, he indicates, is the basis of all these verses of the Christian life by using that little, often overlooked word, therefore. Or in other words, because of that reality, your baptism, therefore this reality, a new life under a new king and Lord, a new life lived under grace, a new life which bears not bad fruit, but good fruit, because you cannot bear good fruit until you have been grafted as vines onto the good tree. And there's only one of those, the tree that grew from the stump of Jesse, the tree of life, named Jesus Christ. Therefore, we deal with our sin, not by trying to control it, but by having Christ kill it, by having it kill him. For his death in our place and his resurrection was the end of our sin and the death of our death. Thus, to die and rise with Christ is the only way to deal with sin. To die and rise with Christ, living in our baptism each and every day. To die and rise with Christ, living in his resurrecting forgiveness each and every day. To die and rise with Christ, eating and drinking his crucified body and his crucified and risen body and blood. And so, not only living in him, but he in us. Christ living in us and working through us. Christ reigning over us from the throne of the cross, his death and resurrection, the pattern of our lives. And then from the life of Christ will flow our life in the world and the fruit of good works. The fancy word Paul uses for that is sanctification. Or in other words, the holy life that we live because the Holy One lives in us. That confidence is what enabled Jeremiah, our Old Testament reading today, to live and prophesy in the midst of such a sinful, rebellious, and murderous world, for he knew that the Lord was with him. And that confidence is what enabled the disciples to go out into the midst of such a sinful, rebellious, murderous world, for the Lord was with them. And that confidence is what enables us to go out into the sinful, rebellious, murderous world that the Lord is with us. For we will have what is most sure in the world, Jesus' name, His promise, His promises, and His Spirit. Our Heavenly Father knows every hair on our heads. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. And you are worth much more than them. For you are worth the death of His only begotten Son. That you might live and not die. That the wages of sin be paid. And so you have the free gift of God, eternal life. In Christ Jesus, your Lord, your King, to live under Him, no longer a slave to sin, but as a redeemed child of God. Today, God wants us not just to understand, but to see our life from His perspective, from His directive, from His work on our behalf, and then by faith, exercise our life of grace in Him for others. In Him, for Him. Don't be overcome with your temporary failures and struggles. Remember the one who called you to faith. He has already made all things possible. The wages of sin may be death. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's certain hope. That's forgiveness. That's life that God gives to you. You know what? He has it all under control. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting.
I invite you to rise for prayer. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near to the Lord's throne of grace and pray as he has commanded us, trusting in our Lord to hear our prayers and answer our petitions according to his mercy. Let us pray. God of all strength, you have brought us from death to life. Do not let sin reign in our mortal bodies and make us obey its passions. Turn our hearts continually to Christ that we would present our bodies as instruments of righteousness. Lord, in your mercy. God of our salvation, your Son warned that your people would face opposition from the world. Give courage and fortitude to your pastors and people that they would boldly sing your praises, gladly endure suffering for the name of Jesus, and continue by your grace to the end. Bless the calling process here at First English and bring a faithful pastor here. Claim your word and administer your sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Father in heaven, the curse of sin brings division within families, among friends, and in our congregations. Grant unity of faith within the households of this church and make this a place where your grace abounds. Give wisdom and peace where there is anger and strife. Help us to live insofar as it's up to us at peace with one another, even when we're annoyed and hurt. Help us to care for one another, even when we're stressed out and stretched thin, and help us to forgive each other, even when that seems difficult. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, keep our feet from falling and preserve us from fear. Make us confident that since you have delivered our souls from death, you will deliver us to walk before you in the sight of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Faithful God, with your favor upon us, we pray you to help us in our fight against temptation and sin. Help us to live holy and righteous lives by the power of your spirit and keep us from surrendering ourselves to the slavery from which Christ has set us free. Lord, in your mercy. Our creator and Lord, from you all things come and to you are all things directed. Provide for our nation faithful leaders who will hear and heed your word, protect liberty and inspire us to use our freedom honorably. Be with those who serve in the military and who protect and serve us in law enforcement, in first responders, and, and all uh, in medical field and other areas that not only help us, but also protect us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Merciful God, give healing and strength to the sick and all afflicted in body or mind, and grant to those who struggle the gift of peace of mind and heart. Hear us especially for those who need our prayers, including Daryl, Jerry, Inez, Lauren, Rental, Ted, John, Brooke, Barb, Dennis, Karen, Audrey, Jerry, Jean, Craig, Donna, Todd, and Wayne, and all else, all others whom we name in our hearts, dear Lord. We pray that, dear Lord, you would be with them, and that you would heal them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, dear Lord, for the gift of marriage. And as Dennis and Karen Marshall celebrate wedding anniversary, open their hearts always to receive more of your love, that their love for each other may never grow weary, but deepen and grow through every joy and sorrow share. Also, we thank you, dear Lord, for the gift of life that you have given to Lenny as she celebrates her birthday. We pray, dear Lord, that you would give them joy in knowing that you are always with them and they can always cast their care on you. And also be with the ladies from the congregation here at First English as they grant them safe travel as they come back home from the Lutheran Women's Missionary League Convention. We pray, dear Lord, that that convention may now uh, see fruit as they go about the work and live the lives that you have called them to live. Lord, in your mercy. And gracious God, grant that all of us who partake of Holy Communion today would present ourselves as those brought out of death into life, repenting of our transgressions and gratefully receiving your Son's body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to us, O Lord, and hear our prayers. Grant to us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be led into all truth and be steadfast in the confession of Christ. We pray this in his name, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 194 as we continue with the service of the sacrament. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels of all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing.
again, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I know uh, on the calendar this week, I guess June 21st, uh, you see that was the first day of summer, but we also can tell uh, when summer comes, when uh, our friends come uh, up to the Northland, like Pastor and Mrs. Roberts from Florida. So uh, I know it's summer when I see them. And, um, you know, I, I just want to tell you this quick uh, little story that fits with our sermon about under control. So this fella goes in uh, to the Bank of America with the intention of robbing him. And he takes a withdrawal slip and he writes in there, give me all your money. And he goes up to the teller and she looks at this and she says, well, I can't read this. So then he thinks, okay, I've got this under control. Uh, there's a Wells Fargo across the street. So he goes over there, he takes that slip and he gives it um, to the teller and she looks at it and says, well, you can't have any money here because this is from Bank of America. <laughs> so he said, He's got it under control. So he, the guy leaves and goes back across the street again. And of course she calls the police while he's waiting in line, they come and arrest him. So things aren't always under control, are they? <laughs> Especially when sin comes. Um, I'd like to invite you, special invitation, uh, to uh, join us for fellowship, but also um, this morning for our Bible class, I'm going to show you uh, some pictures, but also running commentary from my uh, trip to Israel. So um, I invite you to that. And also, there's a few empty seats yet on Friday morning Bible class at 10.30 as we study the letter to the Hebrews. God be with you, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>